Alrighty, <clears throat> it's freezing in here. It'd be better off to be home, I think, tuning in in our beds. But anyway, uh, no, it is so good to be here with you and uh, looking forward to more people coming back over the coming weeks as we increase the, uh, I guess, the, the number of people we're, we're comfortable having in the building. Uh, there is going to be question time tonight. Uh, get, head over to Slido and the code's Vine um, because it's a controversial topic and... Um, and lots of issues will come up. Let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we ask now that you might speak to us through your word, that we'd hear your spirit speaking to us, addressing us, correcting us, changing us, equipping us, that we might know you and serve you uh, with great joy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, once a year, every year, we do a little uh, doctrinal series as a church, and the, the point of it is to bend the pendulum away from that very sugary kind of Christianity that's very common in churches today, and we call this doctrine or theology the study of God, not because we want to know uh, academically more about God, but because we want to know God. And we want to have a relationship with Him. And we started two weeks ago looking at the revealing Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, God speaks to us through His Spirit, that the Spirit of God spoke to the apostles. Uh, he revealed the secret wisdom of God to the apostles. They wrote it down in the Bible so that when we read the Bible, we're hearing God speak to us. This is the voice of the Spirit when we read that to us. But the Spirit's not just at work in the, uh, you know, throwing the baseball at us. He's not just sending us this, but He's also catcher. He's in our hearts receiving what we read because our problem, it's not so much mental or cognitive. Problem isn't that we have a problem with our brains. Problem is we've got a problem with our hearts. We don't want to hear what the Spirit says to us in the Word. And so the Spirit doesn't just reveal through the Bible, he enlightens our minds, the revealing and enlightening spirit, clear eyes. Now last week we looked at the Holy Spirit, that when we speak about the Spirit of God, usually we call him the Holy Spirit, and that's because his great goal and purpose in our lives is to bring us into conflict with that selfish, sinful, twisted part of ourselves he wants to bring us into conflict with that so that we might live a holy life, that we might love the Lord Jesus and we might love our neighbor. And that's the fruit that he's cultivating in us. That's where he's leading us towards into a life of holiness. Uh, he gives us full hearts. So now this week we're looking at the empowering spirit. What is it that makes a spiritual church? a spiritually empowered church. What does a spirit-empowered church look like? If, if we had the gifts of the spirit functioning in our church, what would you expect to see happening in our church? If we were moving in the spiritual realm powerfully, what would that be like? If we were truly spiritual, what gifts would be demonstrated? Now, um, a lot of answers have been given to that very question over the past 100 years. And so uh, it's been told that prior to the 20th century, there was very little that had been written about the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to grab my water bottle. But very ha little had been written about the Holy Spirit. And then 20th century hit and thousands of books were being written about the Holy Spirit. And there was a little revival that occurred in Toronto, out of which came the Toronto Blessing. And when I was a kid, the Toronto Blessing was still going around in churches. And the idea was that uh, the Spirit of God would descend on a church and it would fill the people there with a laughing revival. People would fall on the floor laughing or they'd be slain in the Spirit, lying as if dead. Um, if we were truly spiritual, is that what would happen? Then you had the rise of kind of the prophetic movement, whereby 
um, you'd have this prophetic ministry time in church life. You could come down the front of church. Someone would lay their hands on you and they'd say, Toby Neal, you're going to be a great minister of God when you grow up. You know, I can see great things for you. Uh, sorry, I'm not trivializing, trying not to trivialize. Um, you know, you're going to do really well in career. You're going to do this, that, or the other, the prophetic movement. And then we had uh, kind of the signs and wonders movement. So when I was a kid, Benny Hinn was around, uh, promising healing. There's Kenneth Copeland. These guys still around. And that kind of brings us to our day. And the big guys today are a guy called Todd White, who is, if you've watched him on YouTube, he's the, 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 the loveliest dude. Like, I'd love, to, I'd love to sit down with Todd White because he would just tell me how awesome I am. I'd really appreciate that, actually. Uh, but he's a very genuine guy, but promises. No, God wants to heal you. And then the other movement, of course, is the Bethel movement uh, in California led by Bill Johnson. And, um, you know, Bethel's quite interesting. They're pursuing a signs and wonders ministry. Uh, and, you know, there's stories that come out that um, in church, <coughs> Uh, they're engaging with the spiritual realm and so people are having feathers, angel feathers fall on them in church. The Shekinah glory of God's presence fills their church building and one story was that gold dust fell from the ceiling uh, as God's presence moved into their church. Uh, they have a whole bunch of prophetic stuff, prophetic cards, prophetic dancing and prophetic leggings. So much I looked this up this morning. It's a true story. Um, I, I, they don't make these, but I, you know, someone at their church makes these. And if you wear these leggings, you, you will be more in tune with what God is saying to you. Prophetic leggings, check it out. Um, so they have, you know, a, a church writing today, very influential. Um, uh, they're writing some good songs, actually, and we've had to debate: do we sing their songs or don't we? So that's that, and then you come to kind of just m more mainstream Christianity, which is the whole song, uh, not the, the, the modern worship movement, which is that as we sing praises to God, as we worship God, we praise our way into the presence of God. That we've got to praise our way to God so that blessing would fall on us. So that there's that moment during singing where the tingles go up the spine, we sense the very presence of God and finally the Holy Spirit showed up and that's the time of Holy Spirit ministry. What does a spirit church look like? What would it look like if we were a spiritual church? What are the greater gifts we should desire? Because my goal for this series is that we would be more uh, we would be more filled with the Spirit, that we would experience the fullness of the Spirit. I want us to be walking more in step with the Spirit. We ought to be. So what would that actually look like? Well, there's no better place to go than to uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. So if you've got a Bible, open it up, and we're going to be looking at three chapters, chapter 12, 13, and 14. But pick it up in chapter 12, verse 1, uh, this is a new section in the, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and this is how this section begins. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. So notice the Apostle Paul doesn't want them being uninformed when it comes to the things of the Spirit. Now, if ever there was a church in the ancient world that wasn't uninformed by the things of the Spirit, this would be the church. They were the full Spiro church. Right from the beginning of the letter, we're told that they were gifted incredibly by the Spirit. So look at chapter 1, verse 4, all the way to, through to verse 7. The Apostle Paul says, actually pick it up at verse 5, in Christ Jesus you've been enriched in every way, and then verse 7, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift. You don't lack any spiritual gift. Corinthians, you are the gifted church. 
The Spirit of God is strong with you guys. You are the charismatic church of the ancient world. Uh, the charismata simply means gift. So they're the gift church. They've got all the gifts. You don't like a single spiritual gift. Um, and if you look down chapter 12, verse 7 to 11, you see what all the gifts that they had. They had the gift of wisdom, of knowledge, of faith, of healing, of helping, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing spirits, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. And again in verse 28, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helping, guidance, and tongues. They were the gifted church. And yet Paul says, 12 verse 1, he says, I don't want you to be uninformed about the things of the Spirit. Because they had been uninformed. The context is they're bringing an assessment about spiritual gifts, which is absolutely uninformed, crazy, and wrong. They thought that particular gifts, if you had a particular gift, that made you a more spiritual person. So this brings us to the first point that Paul will say to them. He's saying, no one gift makes you more spiritual than others. And this whole section, chapter 12 all the way to 14, is about him addressing them and their thinking that the gift of tongues, if you got the gift of tongues, you're more spiritual than others. And he writes to correct that issue. Now, what's going on with the gift of tongues? What are tongues? What's the issue? Well, here's my definition of tongues. Tongues is a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit where someone is given a language to speak which they have never learned. So it's a supernatural gift from God the Holy Spirit of a language that you're speaking which you never learned in year 10 you know, language studies or from your parents or whatever. Now we see this gift first arise in Acts chapter two, when um, in Jerusalem there's a festival and the Jews from all over the world had gathered for this festival. And these Jews, they speak all different kinds of language and they come to Jerusalem for Pentecost, for this festival, and they all speak different languages but the Holy Spirit comes with the disciples at Pentecost, the gift finally comes, and we're told that the disciples start speaking in tongues in the same languages as those who'd come from the different parts of the world. So much so that though they hadn't learned these languages, the people hearing them speak heard it in their own language. So there you go, in Acts 2, it's a human language. But in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, it appears possibly that there's another kind of tongues going on, that there's a heavenly language which God gives some Christians. So chapter 13, verse 1, Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels. Now, he may just be uh, using hyperbole there, you may see if you speak, wow, language which is very, imp- it may be that, or it may literally, there may be an angelic language which is given to some people as a gift. Whatever the case, whether it's human or angelic, I don't know, uh, I'm agnostic on it. Either way, the experience of receiving a tongue, a language that you've never learned, but you're able to speak it and others can understand it, wow, that's impressive. Uh, that's spectacular. It's supernatural. And you would be feeling, man, I'm spiritual. Like, this is a real move of the Holy Spirit in my life. I'm speaking this crazy language that I, I didn't even learn. That's incredible. And that's what's going on for the Corinthians. They instinctively assume that because they're able to speak this language, that it makes them more spiritual than others with lesser gifts. And they set up this kind of hierarchy of gifts. Uh, Have a look at chapter 12, verse seven. Uh, Paul says this to them, he says, now to each one the manifestation of given is given for the common good. And then he lists what the gifts are uh, from verse seven and, and he finishes verse 11, all these gifts, he's just mentioned a bunch, 
All of them are the work of the, one, of the one and the same Spirit, and He distributes to each of them just as He determines. So if you sing, you sing like Nate sing, uh, who has an angelic voice, right? Uh, you know, surely He thinks He's pretty spiritual with that kind of voice. Uh, no, 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 he's no more spiritual than the person who's cleaning up after church to make this place COVID safe. Now this is really good, very helpful, because it cuts away at all the pride in church life. Right? I'm a pastor, and I have, I have, I have a gift of teaching. Right? But I, I, I'm being told very clearly here, Toby, you are not any more spiritual than anyone else in this church the gift you've received came from the spirit of god just as the person who's who's going to wipe down the surfaces tonight is serving under the power of the spirit as well there's no inequality in the church there's no you're superior and you now my gift may have a greater impact than your gift more people's lives may be impacted by my gift uh, but that doesn't make me any more spiritual just as Billy Graham's gift far exceeds my gift and his impact will far exceed my impact in the world. So we we do have different impacts and um, but we're both, he's no more spiritual than me. And so that brings humility into our church in a wonderful way. The person who welcomes, serves coffee, cleans, sings, preaches, they're all gifts of the spirit. And, and so no one's to think that they are more spiritual than another. That's the first point. No one gift makes you more spiritual than others. And that brings us to the second point, which is this, that being spiro is not a sign of being spiritual. Now, Paul's addressing a particular way of thinking that's going on in the Corinthian church. They think, because they have this incredible gift, I mean, just, if you were able to speak a language that, uh, you know, in walks a guy from Syria, and you, you haven't started, I don't know what they speak in Syria, but you speak that language, yeah, miraculous, you people go flip, this is incredible. Now the Corinthians are bringing that kind of mind. They have the gift of tongues, and they think, you know what, we're the Spiro church. We're totally Spiro. And Paul says, you might think you're spiro, but you are unspiritual. Chapter 12, verse 1, look again. He says, I don't want you to be uninformed. Come over to chapter 14, which he's, he's kind of wrapping up his argument after he's addressed the issue of tongues and prophecy. Chapter 14, verse 20, he says, Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like kids. In regards to evil be infants, but in your thinking grow up. See, they were childish in thinking. They were captivated by the spectacular, the seemingly supernatural. Tongues, wow, it's incredible. And he says to them, no, you're childish. You're wrong in your instincts. You think tongues, wow, we're so Spiro. And Paul says, no, 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 being Spiro is no sign of being truly spiritual. Come back to chapter 12, verse one again. Notice what he says, because there's a translation issue here. Chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters. He doesn't actually say that. What he actually says is this. Now about the spirituals, pneumatikos, or pneumatikon, uh, and, but the, the, the root is pneumatikos, which simply means spirit. You know, pneuma is the Greek word for spirit, Maybe you know that, uh, but pneumatikos is to be of the Spirit, to be, to, to, to be in the realm of the Spirit. And this is how he starts this section. Now about the spiritual things, or now about the spirituals, now about what it means to be a spiritual person, now, now, now about what it means to be in the Spirit. He's not actually yet addressing the issue of gifts Chapters 12 to 14 is not just about gifts. It's about something much bigger than spiritual gifts. It's about what it means to be a spiritual person. 
And that's gonna have some implications for gifts, but Paul's, he's addressing something way bigger here. And I think the translators are doing it wrong, and you can chase some of the commentaries. Brian Rosner's commentary on Corinthians is exceptional, and he notices this there as well. So the reason I reckon spirituals is better here is because he's already addressed this issue with the Corinthians. So go back to 1 Corinthians chapter three, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and notice what he says about them. He says, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, brothers and sisters, so he's, they're part of the family of God, they're Christians. All right, so they, notice, they're Christians, he's calling them Christians, brothers and sisters, and then he goes on, I could not address you as people who are spiritual, but as people who are still worldly. Now he's not saying they're not Christians. He's just saying you're not acting spiritual. You guys think you're the total Spiro church, but you're unspiritual, you're worldly, you're bringing a worldly point of view to the things of the spirit. You're acting like the rest of the world. You're not acting as though you are indwelt and controlled and under the influence of the spirit of God. You're not spiritual. He's not saying they're not Christians. He's saying you're not acting under the influence of the Spirit, which is part of the reason for this series. I'm really worried that you can be a Christian and you think, yeah, God's given me his Spirit, that's it, automatic. Everything's gonna go well in my Christian life as though it's automatic. It isn't automatic. You need a walk in step with the Spirit. There are things you must do in order to experience the full blessing of the Spirit in me, in you. You've got, the, you've got the spirit. It's not like you kind of got to tap in, plug in somewhere. He's here, the issue is you're ignoring him. And you're not walking with him where he's going, you're going your own direction. And that's what's going on for the Corinthian church. And notice, they, they think they're Spiro, but they're not. You can, you, know, you, can, you can go to a church that's totally Spiro, but just because they're talking about the things of the spirit nonstop, doesn't make them spiritual according to the Apostle Paul. So that's the second thing we're noticing here, that being Spiro is not a sign of being spiritual, being indwelt by the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, under the influence of the Spirit, walking with the Spirit. So what is the evidence then? What would it look like if you were truly spiritual? Well, Paul answers that question in the next verses. Back to chapter 12 and verse 3. Therefore, I want you to know, you know, concerning the things of the Spirit, concerning what it means to be spiritual, therefore I want you to know that no one who's speaking by the Spirit of God so that's it. They think they're speaking by the Spirit of God constantly, and that makes them Spiro. You know, here's the test Paul gives them. No one speaks by the Spirit of God, says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So point three, the evidence of being spiritual is, is that you make Jesus your Lord. That's the key test and evidence of someone who is spiritual. What is a truly spiritual person? The test is, can you say Jesus is Lord? Now, it's not a verbal test. I grew up and my nanny and papa, they had a little budgie and every time I'd walk past it, it'd go, ow! <laughs> and um, and I'd, I'd always wonder whether it was my papa playing a prank on me, whether he was around the corner going, ow! And I was just looking at this budgie going, woo, who's saying that? And he'd say, pull me a cracker, you know. Um, here's the thing, you could teach a budgie, I think, I'm pretty sure it wasn't my grandfather, but anyway, uh, I, you could teach a budgie to say, Jesus is Lord, <laughs> right? You could totally do that, budgie could do it, a lyrebird could do it, I love those lyrebirds, I, I don't know where they could, but gotta get a lyrebird into every talk I can possibly, but. So the test isn't a verbal test, it's a life test. The Apostle Paul's saying that, that, that it is a miracle of God by his spirit when any person embraces Jesus as their Lord. That's a true miracle of the spirit of God. And actually that's the miracle our church is most excited about. That people cross from death to life. That their destinies change from hell 
to heaven, that they stopped thinking Jesus is irrelevant and now he becomes the Lord and Savior of that. That's the true miracle. So Paul's saying no one can say Jesus is Lord except by work of the Spirit of God in their life and that is the true evidence of someone being spiritual. Are they giving themselves to the Lordship of Jesus, seeking to obey him and come under his rule and live a holy life? It worries me because I see a lot of young Christians who want the Spiro experience, but they're hooking up on Friday night, they're getting drunk and doing lines on Saturday night, and then they're going to the Spiro church on a Sunday because they want the spectacular. And Jesus says, that ain't spirituality. You can be Spiro, full Spiro, but not spiritual. The key evidence that you are spiritual is that Jesus is your Lord. But Paul gives us another sign that you might be spiritual as well because that sign's internal, right? Do you really trust and bow before Jesus your Lord? I can't see that. So then he gives an external sign in chapter 13. But have a look at the end of chapter 12. Paul sums up this teaching on gifts and what it means to be spiritual. And he says, now eagerly, chapter 12, verse 31, now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I'll show you the most excellent way. So chapter 13 then shows them the most excellent way, and the most excellent way is about getting married, isn't it? That's the chapter about weddings, right? Wrong, right? It's not about weddings. Chapter 13 is a very practical chapter to a church that is getting the things of the Spirit absolutely upside down, back to front, inside out. And he writes them a very practical chapter about what the most excellent way is, which is love. What is it to be truly spiritual? The outward sign that you're spiritual, the inward sign is Jesus your Lord, the outward sign is that you live a life of love. And it's very practical for the Corinthians because they're impatient, they're suing each other, they're sleeping around. One guy's sleeping with his stepmother-in-law, others are going to prostitutes and sleeping around. There are people in the church suing each other, taking each other to court. There's no love. And Paul writes, chapter 13, and says, you guys think you're full Spiro, and yet you're not patient, you're not kind, you're envying one another, you're boasting you're self-seeking, you're dishonoring others, you're delighting in evil, not in the truth. You're not protecting, you're not trusting, you're not hoping, you're not persevering, your love is failing. And he writes to them, you think you're Spiro, you're not Spiro, there's no love, there's no spirit. The key mark of the Christian, I think we've got a real issue here, the key mark of the Christian is love. And I think there are two groups of people in every church. You've got the guys that know a lot. They know, God, they know stuff about God, but they don't love what they know. It doesn't change their heart, their affections, their feelings. They're just dry, dead, but they got a lot of information. And then you've got a lot of other people that they want the Spiro. Yeah, let's do Spiro. But there's no love. They don't revere Christ as Lord. They think they're spiro, but they're not. They're not spiritual. And here Paul says the key mark of the spiritual person. It's love. You remember chapter 13, verse 1? If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a clanging cymbal and a resounding gong. Absolutely irritating. Incredible gift, powerful gift, supernatural gift, but without love, really irritating. And then he goes on, if I, can spe- if, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries, I've been to more college, read Calvin's Institutes, I can answer any theological question you have. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains and yet do not have love, I am nothing. It's point, I'm pointless. I've got nothing. I am nothing. I'm not spiritual. 
I may have these incredible, exceptional gifts, but without love, you're nothing. Love is the key thing in the Christian life. It's a thing that distinguishes Christians from everyone. Jesus says, they'll know that you're my disciples by the way you love one another. So, and love isn't this kind of idealistic, it's very practical. Are you patient? Are you kind? Do you rejoice when others do well? Or are you envious? Do you boast? Are you self-seeking? Do you dishonor others? Do you delight in the truth and hate what's evil? Does your love always protect, always hope, always trust, always persevere? Does your love never fail? That's the test of the Christian. That's the test of true spirituality. The outward sign you're spiritual is that you live a life of love. Which brings us finally to chapter 14. It's taken him two chapters to get to the point of discussing their issue, which is the issue of tongues. So look at chapter 14, verse one, and this is what it says. Follow the way of love. What's the most excellent way? Love. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire Notice our translation gets it wrong again. It says the gifts of the Spirit. No, 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 it's the Greek word pneumaticon, pneumaticos, the spirituals. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the spiritual things. Be a spiritual person, follow love in order that you might prophesy. That's what he's saying. Live a life of love, a life that values love, caring for others more than yourself, giving up yourself for the good of others, looking to the interests of others ahead of yourself. And if you do that, you won't be captivated by superficial gifts. And if you do, if you're a spiritual person, you will pursue the greater gifts, which he says is prophecy, not tongues. That's the overall argument of chapter 14. So have a look at what he says about tongues. Verse two, he says, anyone who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. Verse four, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. Verse six, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will it be to you? It's not loving, it doesn't benefit you. Verse eight, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how can anyone know what you're saying? You'll be just speaking into the air. It doesn't benefit anyone. If you're following the way of love, why would you do that? Verse 11, if then I don't grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I'm a foreigner to that speaker, and the speaker is foreigner to me. You see, tongues is a gift that doesn't bring the church together. It separates us because I don't understand what you're saying when you're speaking a language that I don't know. Which is why Paul says you're better off prophesying. So come back to verse three. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. So if you're truly spiritual, driven by love, which are you gonna pick? You're gonna pick prophecy because it benefits others. You're not gonna give yourself to tongues. Not that there's anything wrong with tongues. Paul goes on and says, I speak in tongues. He says, and uh, I give thanks to God for that. He's not down on tongues. He's just saying, what is the gift the church should pursue? And the church driven by love should be pursuing the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy, not tongues, is the gift the spirit church should desire well what is prophecy then well we need to understand that don't we well prophecy in its broader sense simply means bringing the word of God to people and there are different kinds of prophecy and there's a big difference between the prophecy you see in the Old Testament and the prophecy you see in the New Testament so in the Old Testament When the prophets say, thus says the Lord, there's no debate, there's no discussion, we don't break off into small groups and and work out, did he say that? What do you think of that? Do you think that's relevant? No, no, when the Old Testament prophets speak, you shut up and listen. That's your job. And you might call that big P prophecy. 
It's authoritative. You don't discuss it, you don't weigh it, you just get on with doing what the prophet said. But when you come to the New Testament, you get a different kind of prophecy, what you might call little p prophecy. Because if you look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29, we're told this, that in church, two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. Now in the Old Testament, when the prophet spoke, you didn't need to weigh it, you needed to shut up, listen, and obey it. But we get to the New Testament, and prophecy takes on something different. It's no longer authoritative the way the prophets in the Old Testament were. It needs to be weighed by the church. So that if someone's prophesying in your community group, you come to you and go, what do, we, what do we think of what Andrew's saying here? Do we think he's onto something? And some people will go, yeah, I think he is. Some will go, no, I'm not. That's weighing. That's what we're to do with prophecy. Now, in the Old Testament, not all prophecy was predictive. Most of it was, uh, was, was not predictive. It was God's done something, and we're living as though he hasn't done something. We need to get in line with God, and, um, and that's relevant as well. So prophecy is important. There's a difference between Old Testament and New Testament. And so the question is, if Paul wants us to be prophesying, how do we do it? Well, let me say again, don't assume that the thing you've seen or heard, which is called prophecy, don't, don't let your instinct shape how you think about prophecy. Um, we hear prophecy, we think something very spiro, very predictive. No, no, no. Come back to the Bible and allow the Bible to shape how you think about prophecy. And look down at verse 3 of chapter 14 because we're told what the effect of prophecy is. Look down at chapter 14, verse 3. The one who prophesies in the New Testament, they speak to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. So the one who's driven by love, who is the truly spiritual person, will speak to people in intelligible, easy to understand language, which strengthens them in their faith, which encourages them to persevere, and which comforts them when life is very hard, that God is with them. Now what is it that strengthens, encourages, and comforts a person, a Christian? Well, it's the word of God. When you're down, what do you need to hear? You need to hear a word from God. When you're tempted to give up, what do you need to hear? You need a, you need a word from God. You need to be reminded of God's goodness, that he will keep his promises. When you're doubting God, what do you need? You need to be encouraged by a word from God. Now, it's it's. it's not clear in the New Testament that prophecy is predicting the future. What is clear is that prophecy involves speaking the word of God to people with particular insight and relevance to them so that they walk away stronger with courage and having been comforted. That's what we're to be doing. Prophecy is the ministry that the Apostle Paul says a spiritual church will give themselves to. Tongues, that edifies yourself. It may be great for you personally to speak in tongues to God in prayer. Great, Paul's not down on it. I'm not down on it. If that's your spiritual life, go for it. I've got no issue with it. But Paul's talking about what makes a person spiritual and what makes a church spiritual. It's not the gift of tongues. The greater gift is the gift of prophecy and he bangs away again and again and again asking them to prophesy. Now let me apply this uh, to us. Um, we need more prophecy in our church. We need you, you need to be speaking the word of God to one another with particular relevance to what's going on in the lives of others so that they're strengthened, encouraged, and comforted, and it's happening. It does happen, I hear it happening all the time. Uh, let me give you a couple of 
examples. A um, number of years ago, there was a public pastoral issue that I had to address that was very painful for, for our church. And I had to address it, and it was difficult. And um, I addressed it on a Sunday night. And the following week, I got a message, I got an email from Gordon Lamb, who no longer comes to church here, but is an absolute legend. Shout out to you, Gordon, if you're listening. And um, he wrote me this email. This is what he said. He said, I really appreciate your courage last Sunday during the meeting regarding this issue. I could see you were deeply sad and exhausted but still able to be strong and stand up in front of everyone answering our tough questions. We do appreciate you being our leader. Now what's he doing there? He's prophesying. He's bringing a word from God to me. The word is that God's people are to honor their leaders. And he's saying that's what we're supposed to do. And Toby, that's what we're glad to do. And what was the impact it had on my life? It strengthened me. Because the particular issue I was addressing, I'm tempted constantly to go weak on. Because it's a hard issue. It's a scary issue. I just want to go soft on it. He's like, Toby, you're our leader and we love you. Keep leading us. Be courageous. And he strengthened me. You do that all the time. But we need to do that to one another. I'll tell you another story. I had a moment uh, last year or the year before, I can't remember, where Beck Guillaume who was a member of our church and um, who had cancer and she was in hospital and, um, and her own oncologist was away and she had this different oncologist come in and the oncologist said to her with no family present, just the uh, terrible bedside manner, but he said to her, Beck, you're not, you're not gonna leave hospital. You're gonna die here. And it was just devastating for her coming to that realization. She did leave, she lived another year. And uh, so she got out, that guy was wrong, hallelujah. But but she was shattered and and heartbroken. And uh, me and Emma Waterhouse, Emma's a a lady in the morning, uh, I took Emma with me to go visit her to prophesy. And and we sat down with her and, and I said to her, Beck, are you ready to meet Jesus? And she said, she broke into tears, and she was like, Toby, I don't know. She's like, I'm so full of doubts. I I don't know if I'm a Christian. Am I a Christian? And Emma and I had the great privilege. We opened up Psalm 23, and we made clear to her that it's not our hold on Christ which saves us. It's his hold on us that saves us. In my, That was one of the most wonderful moments in my life to date. Easily top three moment, maybe top four. I got married, I've had three kids. Okay, it's number five, right? <laughs> it was, it was, what, what was happening there? We were prophesying. We were, now, I'm a, you don't need a theological degree to do that. You could do that. You know that it's not our hold on Jesus, it's his hold on us that saves us. You know that when we are suffering the way to comfort someone is to remind them that the shepherd that they follow is with them and loves them and won't let them go you can do that it was the greatest one of the greatest moments of my life prophecy that's what it is a couple of weeks ago we had a talk on euthanasia I preached on euthanasia and then we invited Megan Best along who is an expert a medical doctor and an expert in the field of palliative care and she shared her Christian thinking and her medical expertise on the issue of euthanasia she wasn't preaching she wasn't the shepherd pastor of our church in that moment she was just a normal Christian prophesying to God's people for our strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Here is an issue that's going on in our society which we need to be informed about, and she's the expert. And so she starts speaking, and what happened? Ah, you're joining the dots on what the Christian life is about. We need more of this. What we do in our community groups each week is prophecy. 
So you need to talk, you need to contribute, you need to say, hey, I think this is what the Bible's saying here, and this is why I think it's relevant for our community. You gotta drive hard at the point of application, and you've gotta talk, what is God, the living God, who's present by his spirit in this moment? What is he saying to us today? Where are we going wrong? What, what comfort do we need to get out of this? Who is it in your community group that needs a clear word from God, from the Bible, but a clear word from God applied to them that would give them strength to keep following him? It's why it's so important we're doing interviews every week at church. every, Every week I'm like, Nate, who's being interviewed this week? I need to hear the story of other Christians sharing the word of God in their particular life situation. That's what prophecy is. And we need more of it if we are to be built up, strengthened, encouraged, and comforted. Because life is bloody hard and following Jesus is really hard. And this is, we we are all in this together. It's not just my words, the preacher, which we need to hear each week. We need everyone's words. But I see that happening It's really happening. What would it look like if we saw this happening? Well, we would see you teaching kids the Bible on Sunday mornings. We would see people getting trained up to preach the Bible to congregate, and that's what we're doing with Ben and Josh and Joey and Benji. We're training them to become preachers. We would see hospitality offered so that when people come in to hear the word of God, they see a community of people that genuinely love one another and are seeking to grow together as they hear the word of God. We would see people welcome people into our community because it's really hard and uncomfortable walking in and hearing the word of God. We want to make that easier for people. We'll sing the word of God to one another for each other's encouragement. And we'll even do crazy, weird, operational stuff so that it's safe to hear the word of God together. And then of course, it won't just be a formal thing, it'll be an informal thing. That in all our conversations, we're looking for ways to bring the word of God to God's people. That's the church the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to be. Being spiro is no sign of being spiritual. There is no spiritual gift which makes you more spiritual than others. The true sign you are spiritual is that you're living with Jesus as your Lord and you're living a life of love and if that's the case the truly spiritual church will prophesy because the thing we need most is a word from God applied directly to our situation so that we're stronger we've got courage and we're comforted clear eyes full hearts can't lose Clear eyes, the Spirit's giving us clear eyes so that we'd see how wonderful Jesus is. Full hearts that the Spirit's given that we might love. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is and this week we see it again when we're talking about gifts. The gifts are unimportant, really. What's really important is will we do what's good for others? Love directs the gifts and next week can't lose. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for the greatest gift you've given in yourself to us today so that you are with us working in our lives powerfully and personally to make us like the Lord Jesus Christ, people who are living lives of love. We pray that we wouldn't be obsessed with spectacular things, but that we might give ourselves to the ordinary life of loving others of seeking to build them up in the faith, of speaking for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Help us to give ourselves to this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.